Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, my name is Zachary Bakke. I'm the Knowledge Management Specialist for the Bureau for Food Security. I'm welcoming you today to uh, our February session of the Ag Sector Council Seminar Series, uh, sponsored by the Bureau for Food Security, USAID's Bureau for Food Security, and um, implemented by the Knowledge Management, or Knowledge Driven Microenterprise Development uh, Project. Uh, and so, Welcome you today to um, our presentation on agriculture extension and advisory services under the new normal of climate change. Um, before we get started, a uh, few points of logistics. Um, please hold questions until the end. Uh, we do uh, Q&A at the end so that uh, people have a chance to speak into the mic uh, and those online can uh, hear the questions as well. So if you ask questions out of during the presentation, people can't hear uh, what you're saying. Uh, additionally, please put phones on vibrate, silent, or what have you, so that uh, we don't interrupt the presentations. Um, that said, also, um, when asking questions at the end, please state your name and organization before asking your question. Uh, with that, um, I'm going to give a few announcements. So some of our upcoming AgriLinks events, we've got the next Ask Ag uh, Twitter chats. Uh, happening on March 8th, and this is going to be around International Women's Day. It's going to be about uh, women and ag. Uh, the next uh, event is also going to be uh, March 22nd. We're going to have another ag uh, Twitter chat. We're going to be doing this uh, in collaboration with the Water Office uh, within uh, USAID's within USAID uh, around ag and water issues. And then our next Ag Sector Council will be March 27th. It will be around uh, post-harvest losses. We're going to uh, hopefully have a panel with uh, USAID, uh, Grain Pro, and the ADM uh, Institute for Prevention of Post-Harvest Loss at the University of Illinois. So please look forward to that. Um, also, we'd like to highlight a symposium brought to you by um, our uh, implementing partner, MIAS, so Modernizing Extension and Advisory Services. Um, it's on improving the provision of extension and advisory services. Evidence from the field is going to be taking place June 5th through 7th uh, in DC. Uh, you can register by May 1st. The, we've got flyers for people who are in person that you can pick up outside on the table. Uh, for those of you online, there's the link. Uh, you can follow to register as well. So please check that out. Um, they give very good uh, workshops and, uh, uh, and symposiums. So I'd like to uh, highlight the fact that this is the fourth year of us bringing you Ag Sector Councils. Um, and this is, uh, on this map of the globe, you can see um, this is for all the, the people who are represented um, via the online audience and for in person. Uh, we've got dots in every country from across the globe for people who have participated. Um, and this is only tracking um, for the past three years when we've brought it to you online. So it reaches uh, across the globe uh, as well as you know across uh, the United States. And we're very happy that uh, you've all been a part of this. And uh, many of you have returned over and over again to, to participate. Um, with that, I'd also sort of highlight you know, the, the increased participation over, uh, you know, we continue to have large audiences. Uh, the year three, that was our spike when we had the uh, integration series for climate change and natural resource management. I'd highlight that as a, a series that we've got that captured on uh, AgriLinks. Um, it would be a, it's a nice piece to actually uh, see and uh, view um, in relation to today's talk as well. So uh, thank you again. Uh, last year, uh, I think we averaged probably about 100 participants per uh, Ag Sector Council. Many of you joining us uh, online, and probably about 20% of our online audience coming from uh, participating from around the globe. So we appreciate all your feedback. We appreciate your your attendance, and thank you again. Uh, I'd also like to to highlight and thank the people that uh, make this possible. Um, uh, within U.S. Aid, uh, the Ag Sector Council Seminar Series was the the brainchild of. Uh, Don Thomas, who's currently serving as the uh, office director in uh, USAID Afghanistan for the uh, Economic Growth and Ag Office there. Uh, I'd also like to highlight uh, Belin Tedis, uh, who I believe is serving at uh, USAID uh, Ghana currently, who actually shepherded this uh, Ag Sector Council for the first few months before uh, convincing me to, to take over as uh, to manage it. Uh, and then also I'd like to thank Stacy Young, who's currently in 
uh, USAID's uh, Policy Planning and Learning Bureau in uh, the Learning Evaluation and Research Office. Um, she was the uh, creator of the KDMD project and um, welcomed us as a buy-in that allowed us to, to actually bring you these events. And then within KDMD, uh, all the people who help on uh, bringing you these, these uh, presentations and bringing you the quality user experience that uh, you've come to enjoy. Uh, Megan Murphy, who is uh, my counterpart uh, at KDMD, who started this off, uh, who's currently over at uh, FHI 360, um, and who was here for the, the first three years. Uh, Dar Maxwell, who's in the back of the room, who brings uh, such great uh, audio quality to, to um, these presentations for those of you online. Uh, you have her to uh, thank often. Um, also working with her is Adrian Gaskin. He's also uh, help, helping in doing that. Um, Julie McCarty, who's my current counterpart, uh, working on uh, the Ag Sector Councils and has been working with me for over a year on this. Uh, Maciej Himaleski, who uh, does our great green room interviews that you often see on the blog posts uh, on AgriLinks. And uh, Lindsay Levin, and for also working on the, the blog and also doing our Twitter handle. And uh, Bethel Alamu, uh, who uh, does a lot of the logistics, uh, the coffee and everything like that that you're, you're enjoying now too. So with that, uh, I'll go on to um, introduce our speakers. Uh, our speakers, um, Brent Simpson is an associate professor of international development in the Department of Agriculture, Food, and Resource Economics at Michigan State University. And over the past three year, years has worked in over 20 countries, primarily in Africa. Currently, he serves as the deputy director of the USAID-funded Modernizing Extension and Advisory Services MIAS project, a Feed the Future initiative and, for the Feed the Future initiative, and manages uh, MSU's involvement uh, in several international agriculture development efforts. Also joining us is Gay. It's Burpee. Burpee. Yep. Uh, is with Catholic Reef Services, uh, senior advisor on climate change and rural livelihoods for Latin America and the Caribbean. She oversees the region's work at the nexus of climate change, uh, rural livelihoods, and natural resources. Uh, she also served as senior technical advisor for agriculture, environment, and deputy regional director for Latin America uh, programs. Uh, with that, I'll pass that over to Brent uh, to speak. This is forward. OK. All right, good afternoon, or morning, I guess. Um, don't know whether you realize it or not, but this uh, seminar was rescheduled from last fall. Uh, we were supposed to be giving this at the end of October when uh, Hurricane Sandy uh, slammed into the eastern seacoast of the United States and disrupted uh, most of your lives and certainly mine as well. It's probably fitting that an event like that postponed this seminar. Um, us cautious scientists like to say that no single weather event can be attributed to climate change, but by definition, global climate change affects every single weather event. For the past 37 years, the average uh, temperature, uh, global temperature, has exceeded the 20th century uh, norm. The difference between climate and weather, climate is the accumulation of 30 years of weather data. So we've already changed the climate. It's happened. It's going to continue to happen. And we want to talk to you today about helping farmers and others working in different parts of the world to adapt and adjust to the changes that are going to be taking place. Um, our presentation is divided into four uh, sections. The first is kind of setting the context. It's not just climate change, but it's climate change in a particular context. We're going to review some of the new normals, what we're calling new normals of climate change, look at some important uh, concepts and principles related to climate change research and adaptation, and finally come back to some best practices and best prospects. I'm going to stand over here so I'm not interfering with people's uh, vision. Sometime in the fall of uh, 2011, world population passed uh, 7 billion. Uh, we're on our way by mid-century to probably 9 or 10 billion people on the planet. The World Bank has uh, estimated that we needed to increase basic cereal production by about 100% by mid-century. The FAA has been a bit more cautious in their projection projections, coming in at about 70% increase by 2050. USAID in this building is looking at a 60 to 70 percent increase in basic cereal production. A 60 to 70 percent increase in cereal production is roughly equivalent to what the globe produced 
1979 and 1985. So we have to add that in addition to what we're already producing in order to feed everyone within the next 37 years. Um, we've done that in terms of percentage uh, change over that time period, but we've never done that in terms of volume. This is going to be a huge and very uh, significant challenge facing us as we go forward. If we look at where this growth is going to come from, this graph shows the, the red and blue lines are uh, productivity and yield increases. They're all going up. The green line down there is the land base. We already have under production all the best lands suitable for cereal production in the world. There are no new lands out there yet to bring under production. So we have to find this additional productivity somewhere else. It's not just going to be expansion of the number of hectares under cultivation. So we're talking about closing the yield gap then on those lands under production. I'm sorry, this slide is very small, but I want you to focus on some of the colors. The top uh, map is for maize, middle is wheat, and bottom is rice. These are maps of the global areas of uh, principal productivity for those crops. Uh, the red indicates those areas that are constrained by soil uh, nutrients. The blue is those areas that are constrained by soil and water limitations, and the green are those areas that are already within 75% of their uh, estimated maximum productivity. So these are the areas where we have to increase our, our production for the principal cereals. If we look at soil productivity, uh, soil amendments first, uh, during the Green Revolution in the 1960s and 70s, we got great bang for buck. Additional kilograms of cereals for each additional pound or kilogram of nitrogen added to the soil environment. Going forward, the addition of more inputs to those soil environments is not generating that many more kilograms of output. So we have some limitations there particularly for those areas that are already approaching their, their productive maximum. If we look at water, these three graphs here, agriculture on the left, domestic use and industry on the right, we focus on agriculture. Over the last 50 years, we've, in, we've increased the amount of water used by agriculture by 100%. By it's doubled since the 1950s. Agriculture already uses 70 to 80% of available fresh water on the planet. The issue is can we begin to double the water utilization to boost those yields to meet the, the demands of the future? That's a huge question. This is the big picture. Uh, the top lines, uh, the green line is consumption. It's pretty steady. It's going up in reflection of changing diets in addition of population. Uh, the orange line is productivity. When that line is, when the orange line is below the green, we're in a deficit period. We're drawing down in our stocks. When it's above the green line, we're in a period of surplus. We're adding to those stocks. We're just barely keeping weight with the population demands as it is. The bottom, uh, th those are the standing stocks of cereals. They're level at best, declining most likely, and certainly the gap between current consumption and future consumption levels and where we are in stocks is growing. That's putting in risk than future generations or f future time periods for uh, shortfalls in, in ability to feed everyone. Moving on to energy. Energy is hugely important for agriculture. Certainly over the last uh, century, we've seen a, a precipitous increase in, in energy consumption tied mostly with economic growth. Most of that energy is coming out of petro petroleum sources, uh, uh, crude oil, coal, natural gas. Agriculture uses approximately 12% of the global energy. It doesn't seem like a lot, but it's very important. Um, we look at historically, any economist will tell you when you have a finite resource and you're increasing demands on that resource, prices are going to be going up. And that's exactly what we've been seeing uh, with oil prices. They're going up and they're going to keep going up as we go farther into the future. Um, it's really hard to see this graph, but there's, there's some very faint bars in the background. That shows the discovery of new sources of petroleum energy. We've basically discovered already all the major sources of petroleum energy on the planet. The thin line that's, that's draped over the top of that shows the, the development of those resources. We're already past peak oil. We've already identified and, and, and extracted the easy to get to the cheap oil, the cheap resources that are out there. There's about an equal amount out there that we can still pull down or pull up out of the ground, but it's going to be increasingly more expensive to get to. Uh, agriculture, in terms of uh, industrial productivity, uh, the budget for, for industrial agriculture, about 28% goes into energy sources directly. And when you look at the food on the shelf or food in the markets, 40 to 50% of the cost of that food is tied up in transportation, typically run off liquid fuels. Agriculture by itself is 60 to 70% uh, sensitive to oil prices, uh, predominantly. When we look at the food price spike of 2008, 2009, 
uh, we see that the, the oil price, which is the blue line at the bottom, was pushing up the food price. So this, this twinning of energy prices and food prices is very important, particularly when you begin to think about climbing energy prices in the future and climbing demands. Looking back over the past decade, we see our principal cereal prices trending upwards. Obviously, there's some real vicissitudes in that line. But given all the drivers of, that are pushing this line up, we can imagine that that's probably going to trend in those directions going into the future. So what happens when food prices go up? Um, well, again, I really apologize for the background. It's kind of hard to see this. This is a great graph here. It shows basically, again, the 2007-2008 the, the price spikes. The, the red lines below that are uh, violent uh, demonstrations, riots, where there's been loss of life tied to uh, uh, principally food prices. For the urban poor, who spend 60 to 70 percent on their disposable incomes on food, when you get a doubling of basic grain prices, basic cereal prices, they tend up to, to, to take to the streets. They pick up rocks and stones and flip over cars because they simply can't keep themselves fed, them and the families, and they begin to blame them the seats of power. Uh, you can go back in history and see the same, same kind of relationship in England in the 1700s with the bread riots and, and uh, climbing prices for grains. Uh, so this is something we need to keep in mind going forward. If prices are going to tend up, it's going to act as a destabilizing influence on those governments that are trying to create uh, a calm and tranquil uh, policy environment to allow uh, their, their different agencies and ministries to begin to address some of the important challenges that we have before us. Okay, so this is the context. This is what's happening in the world without climate change. Now, we really want to then turn our attention to what additional uh, forcing influences climate change is going to bring to the fore. I'm really going to talk about two here today. One is trends, the other is disruption. First, we look at trends. Uh, going back over the past uh, 650,000 years, CO2 levels have never been anywhere near as high as they have now. Uh, that's just a fact. This is a great graph. If we look at the last 300,000 years, we see uh, the blue line uh, is CO2 concentrations. The red line is, is temperature. The important thing to take in here is that the temperature and CO2 levels track each other very closely until we get over to the right-hand side of the graph, and the blue line is way above the red line. That's suggesting that these sort of relationships are going to hold true in the future, that temperature is going to be rising going forward. Um, we're a lot of the scientists are, are proposing that we need to keep our, our emission levels below 350 parts per million in the atmosphere. Just before coming in here today, I checked uh, with the Mauna Loa record, we're at about 395 parts per million, certainly way above the 350 that suggested to keep us uh, below a threshold where a lot of uh, very unpleasant environmental consequences will be set in motion. Just to put this in context, the two little arrows down at the bottom, the one to the left is about indicates when our, our species, our human species, first emerged in its current physical form, Homo sapiens, about 200,000 years ago. The arrow to the right is when we evolved in sort of our modern social structures. We're pretty much, we're, we're very recent. It's good to look at the temperature regimes that were in place during those time periods. If you look right over here, right there, that's where agriculture, modern agriculture, where agriculture in general emerged. The last 11, 10, 11,000 years. It emerged at a point where the temperatures were fairly uh, constant, fairly favorable. Looking at that larger record, though, we can't assume that those sort of favorable conditions are going to hold true going forward. And when you begin to look at the forcing uh, effects of CO2 concentrations, um, it should be a cause for concern. Um, looking at the last 1,000 years, the red line at the bottom is the temperature graph. It's going up as we move into present day. On the right-hand side are all the IPCC model projections for temperature in case increases given different scenarios for emissions and policy changes. World Bank came out in December with their estimation that we're looking probably at a four degree temperature change by the end of the century. Some of the more pessimistic scientists looking at cons uh, current energy consumption levels and emission rates think we're probably looking at more of a, a six degree temperature change by the end of the century. That's huge. That's huge. That's chilling. Uh, that would change reality, change life on this planet uh, almost forever. Um, what does the empirical data tell us? The red dots uh, denote over the last 20, 25 years, uh, temperature increases. The size of the dots uh, denote uh, the magnitude of the increases. Temperatures have been going up virtually everywhere, more rapidly at the poles. 
Uh, as temperatures have gone up, on the left is Greenland, on the right is Antarctic, the ice shields begin to melt. Uh, as the oceans have heated, that the water has expanded, giving rise to sea level rise with the addition of fresh water. Sea level has begun to rise and more, rising more rapidly more recently. Overall, when we look at uh, glaciers, uh, land and, and sea ice is, is going down worldwide. If you want to see a fantastic film about this, you want to look for James uh, Balog's uh, Chasing Ice film. Uh, it's absolutely stunning uh, visual evidence of the retreat and death of some of our most important glacial systems on the planet from a human view. It's not looking down from satellites, but it's looking straight on. Uh, it's sort of like looking at the first uh, Apollo pictures of the planet from space, that blue ball. This is looking at climate change in the real, and it's quite chilling. Um, as the sea, sea levels have begun to change in terms of their temperature, they have influences on the uh, global circulation patterns or global climatic patterns. This slide here is showing the East Asian monsoon, uh, showing a decline in the uh, number and intensity of windy days. Uh, the East Asian monsoon, monsoon is linked to the Asian monsoon, which is responsible for the climatic uh, patterns that feed about 3 billion people on the planet. So when you see disruptions on these important weather patterns, the implications of the people living on the ground producing food in those areas is quite significant. Overall, precipitation uh, record is a bit different. Uh, as air warms, it's able to hold more moisture, so we would expect to have more, more rainfall, but it's not uniform in its distribution. Essentially, when we're looking at areas that are already moisture stressed, the projections are in the future they're going to become more stressed. Those areas that are already receiving reasonable or sufficient amounts of rainfall may be receiving more rainfall going forward. So you can pick out your zones of operation, your zones work. The blue dots represent in, uh, rainfall increases. The yellow, orange, and red are decreases in rainfall. Um, again, another slide that's very difficult to see. Uh, but this is basically a global map of the principal wheat, rice, maize, and soy producing areas looking at the last 28 years. Uh, the top is showing uh, differences in standard deviations for temperature in those principal regions. Um, the bottom is looking at uh, standard deviation changes in precipitation. So the temperature regimes are definitely going up all across the world. On the bottom, the, the record for precipitation change is about mix. About half the areas are getting more, about half are getting less. Uh, the impact on temperature change in particular is very important for crop productivity. Cereals are, are not uh, exempt from that. And when we begin to, to kind of drill this down to the impacts of that onto national economies, those economies that are based largely uh, on agriculture, and that agriculture is largely rain-fed, when you have disruption in the rainfall patterns, uh, it can have an immediate and direct uh, impact on the GDP. This is a graphic of, of the economies for Africa. Uh, the top is a rainfall uh, pattern over about a 40-year uh, period. The bottom is the GDP. So you see that the GDP for these countries tracks very closely to the rainfall record. So you look at a more dis disruptive rainfall regime in the future, you can look at less resources being available to many of those economies to invest in infrastructure, to invest in human capital development, and a lot of the other necessary types of investments uh, to address some of the climate change challenges. All right, what are the trends? These are the kind of big trends that have been occurring, that will be occurring. Another important feature of climate change, sorry getting to it in the end, is this disruptive character, right? This is a great graphic. This is the 10-year running mean for rainfall distribution in Zimbabwe. And I like to use this just because it, it, it captures the idea well that the magnitude uh, of the climate system, uh, the amount of disruption is going to be uh, increasing as we go further. This is much too cyclical in nature to really get the aspect of disruption done. But it helps you to visualize or think about what disruption might mean in terms of agriculture in those areas. This is all, again, looking at rainfall. Um, oceans are warming, more energy in the system, we're generating more storms. This is the uh, storm frequency for the uh, North Atlantic over the last 75 years. Definitely going up, no question about that. Uh, more moisture in the air, leading for more uh, significant rainfall events. Flooding is going up globally by contact, by continent, no question about that. This is a, a, a graph of heat waves, uh, both real and then projected going in the future. This star right here is the 2003 heat wave in Europe that killed 70,000 people. Um, it's estimated by the end of the century that areas such as West Africa, the average temperatures will exceed current highs. So 
if you've been out in the Sahel in May and it's 48, 49, 50 degrees, can you imagine that as an average temperature? And then the high period going up from there, what's, what's going to happen to the people who used to live in those environments? Because they won't be able to live there any longer. Uh, as things have heated up and dried out, we've had the explosion of wildfires uh, on every continent of the globe. When you begin to stack all these things up, this is what the disruptive character of our environment is looking like. And this is not an artifact of measurement systems. This is all during modern times. It's all very well substantiated, very solid data records. It's just getting more chaotic out there. And so we're having to produce 60 to 70 percent more um, food moving into mid-century. We're having to do that with declining resources, more expensive energy, and in a more disruptive environment. For those of us who work in agriculture, you probably can't imagine a more uh, scary scenario. OK, climate change, very complex. It's nonlinear in nature. There's lots of feedback loops and linkages, internal linkages. There's tipping points, which if we exceed or go past, we can't come back from. Things are set in motion that we, have, we can't recover from. There's huge amounts of inertia in this system. And it's very, very long lasting. A molecule of CO2 in the atmosphere lasts between 30 and 94 years. Uh, some of it's more or less permanent. So the emissions that are up there are going to be there for a good long while. And we still don't have the means to begin to back off or limit those emissions globally. So what does this look like for agriculture? Greenhouses, gases are going up. The primary impact is the rising temperatures. Going from left to right, the impacts on agriculture are changes in seasonality. Uh, increase in daytime high, increase in nighttime high, changes to continental and subcontinental monsoon patterns, increased atmospheric moisture, and a melting of land and sea ice. Those are the primary impacts. Secondarily, again going from left to right, seasonality changes influence flowering of plants, uh, behavior of pollinators, the relationship of pests and, 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 and prey species, photosensitivity of different plant species, Change in daytime high impacts uh, plant maturation, grain fill, sterilization. Nighttime high prevents, uh, increases, prevents plants from shifting over into respiration, also declining their yield potential. Changes in the monsoonal pattern, again, have impact uh, at the field level in terms of uh, rainfall pattern changes. Increased moisture in the atmosphere increases the frequency, the intensity, and the out-of-season character of the rainfall events. And lastly, the melting sea ice rises sea levels leads to salinization of water systems, and will also exert a, a loss of uh, irrigation water in those inland areas. All right, so how do we begin to wrap our heads around this uh, in terms of concepts, uh, perspective, uh, ways of approaching the problem? The first line up there is really important. We have to understand what the risks are, the nature of the risk, what the vulnerability uh, are for uh, both human and natural systems with regard to those risks. What are the relative resiliencies in those systems that, can, that are existing and can be enhanced? It will be very important moving down to help to locate uh, spatially appropriate uh, types of, of, of interventions, uh, to temporarily phase our interventions. Each inter when you're, when you're, on, when you're a tr on a trend line, each technological or social innovation is going to have a window of opportunity. And it's going to be suboptimal before that and suboptimal after it. So we're going to have to look at putting in line a whole series of types of inter interventions, phasing them appropriately. And we're going to have to begin to pair both our technological interventions with the support of social uh, capacities that are needed to, to make them really work. Certainly, we're going to have to readopt uh, systems thinking, uh, begin to anticipate some of the linkages between important components in the natural system and the human systems, and begin to apply broad principles in terms of their ability to achieve multiple t objectives. With regards to a very relevant topic for extension, uh, we're going to be needing to look at evidence from the past, experiences from the past, and experiences in other places on the globe that are wetter, drier, hotter, more disruptive, uh, to try to extract those lessons so that we can move them and apply them into new locations. This will give our research systems some much needed time to begin to develop new technologies. And lastly, we're going to have to, by default, begin to rely on, on farmer agency, their own creativity and abilities to respond much more. The 90s was the decade in the development uh, era of, of in indigenous knowledge. Uh, and we're going to have to come back and rely on those indigenous capacities a lot more, because we're not going to have 
10 and 20 year research cycles to really fine tune individual technologies. We're going to have to deliver half baked things to farmer and let them do the local adaptation to develop in situ. Okay, when we look at the role of those of us who are in the extension field, vis-a-vis uh, -vis these challenges, in particular uh, the adaptation to climate change, there's, there's three things that are very important. Mitigation, adaptation, and vulnerability and resiliency. And we'll start with, with mitigation. Um, agriculture by itself, the very act of feeding ourselves contributes about one-third of the greenhouse gases to the environment. We can't feed ourselves without being part of the problem. That's going to be very important for uh, researchers and extensionists. We're going to have to pick up and begin to deal with the mitigation issues. Um, this is just a graphic uh, from the UN uh, EP uh, 1 billion uh, tree campaign. But, but the notion here is that there's about 1.8 billion smallholder producers around the world. They manage about 22 million square kilometers of the Earth's surface. That Earth's surface has a huge potential for sequestering carbon and widow, widow, uh, not widow, <laughs> uh, uh, woody biomass. And then the transition of that biomass leaf, leaf fall litter into more productive soils that have a higher carbon content. So we need to find ways of engaging this magnitude of, of smallholders and this immense surface area in sequestration activities. And by the way, the uh, 1 billion tree complaint is, is approaching 13 billion trees planted thus far. We need to double that and probably double that again to begin to have appreciable impact on CO2 levels. But it's very important. Uh, in terms of adaptation, we really don't have much experience about with that. Uh, we've lived in a pretty stable place, uh, all things considered. This is a graph from the West African Sahel area showing the rainfall uh, over uh, the last century. Uh, beginning in about 1955, the, the rainfall had hit a high and began to decline. And around 1970, in most places, it, it, it crossed the border uh, of those sort of mean rainfall levels and went down and stayed down for 30 years. One of the few examples that we have historically of, of significant environmental change. And so you have to ask yourself, those farmers living across the cell, what did they do? Well. They first began to change the location where they planted certain crops, <clears throat> moving into wetter, more water retentive soils. Uh, they began to acquire new varieties of their traditional crops. Those were more heat tolerant, more uh, 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 moisture uh, stress tolerant. They began to expand, expand the cultivation of other crops, those crops that they didn't traditionally grow, but that were more uh, adapted or suited to the new conditions. And they made wholesale changes in, in land use. They abandoned certain areas and then began to invest more in irrigation and pumping technologies. Overall, the extension and advisory services did not really respond because they thought things were going to return to normal. We just had to tighten belts for a couple of years and we'll go back to the way things used to be. Well, for us here now, that's not an option. Things will never go back to the way they were. When we have to get used to that idea, it's not a 10-year problem. It's not a 30-year problem. It's going to be with us for as long as our species is on the planet. We've got to get wake up to this essential point. OK, I'm going to pass over the, the microphone to Gay, and she's going to talk about uh, some ex research and experiences on vulnerability and adaptation. OK, which is the? Um, this is forward, and that's back. OK. OK, um, I'm going to focus on some of the implications of what Brent has said. Um, and I've been focusing on Latin America and the Caribbean for the last six years. And so most of the examples will come from there. Uh, in 1998, Central America was hit by a 200-year hurricane uh, with 180 mile per hour winds. 50 inches of rain, 22,000 deaths in Honduras where the hurricane centered, economic losses of 7 billion, agricultural losses of 2 billion, and a third of farmers in Honduras uh, had total crop losses, and 10,000 hectares of topsoil were stripped. Afterwards, world neighbors and a consortium of uh, agencies went in to analyze um, some of the impacts. And what they found was that on conservation agriculture plots, plots that had permanent vegetative cover, had rotations, soil and water conservation, 
uh, depending on the country, there was 58 to 99 percent less damage on those plots than conventional plots, 28 to 38 percent more topsoil, two to three times less surface erosion. But in areas where there were gullies or landslides above those conservation agriculture plots, there was the same damage inflicted on conservation and conventional tillage plots. Um, when I went into Nicaragua right afterwards, uh, well, actually, it was about 10 months afterwards, farmers said, we ignored you when you were training us in soil and water conservation because we thought it was a waste of our time. And they pointed to a slope um, where the plot that it had been there had completely washed into the ravine. And they said, we beg you to come back and teach us again. Because now we understand. And they pointed to a plot that had conservation agriculture and was still there and still had crops on it. Um, extension and advisory services need to support and seek behavior change, not only at the household, farm household level, but at the plot level and at the watershed management level. Um, and crisis, when it happens, can be used as a catalyst for change. That is one of the windows of opportunity that Brent referred to. At the same time, trends in agriculture, the investments have gone down um, from a high in the 1980s and then they dropped in the early 2000s. There have been changes in that. There have been increases. But globally, the trend was that public investment went down. Um, and in Latin America, there was a, up to a 70% drop in funds to extension over the last three decades. Yet agriculture is 15 to 30% of the national economies. In addition, 70% um, of the soils in Africa and 80% of the soils in Central America are degraded. And the percentage of land affected by human-induced soil degradation is high in those regions. Uh, at the same time, soil research um, stopped or um, decreased significantly in the 1990s. OK, getting to the specifics, this is an example of the climate patterns we're seeing in Latin America. It's a hot spot in Honduras, El Paraiso. And the blue bars are precipitation. The solid lines are um, the current levels of precipitation. And the dotted lines are what are expected by the end of the 2020s. And what you see over in the months of May to about August, September is the growing season. May's yields, um, this is based on research that CRS did with SIOT and CIMIT, two of the CGIAR institutes. And um, what you see is that during the early growth stages of May's and in important critical stages, the rainfall is decreasing. Um, the lines are the minimum temperature, the mean temperature, and uh, the maximum temperatures. And uh, the one that I want to point out to you is the bottom yellow line of um, minimum temperature, because the, what you see is that the dotted line is creeping up above 18 degrees Celsius in the middle of the growing season. And uh, that becomes very important for beans, because if beans don't see a temperature that goes below 18 degrees Celsius at night, they will not flower. And if they do not flower, they will not produce beans. OK. What we did in um, a study called Tortillas on the Roaster, is uh, we came up with a traffic light mapping system. And um, 
the um, red areas are hot spots where we expect to see 50% uh, or more yield losses in maize and beans. Sorry. And in those areas, production of maize and beans will no longer be an option. And uh, farmers are going to have to transition out of current livelihoods into other types of livelihoods. In the yellow or orange areas, uh, there's going to be up to 25 to 50% losses. And uh, the focus there will be, have to be on adaptation of the production systems with conservation agriculture, wind breaks, better water use, et cetera, supplementary irrigation. The pressure spots is where um, maize and beans um, in, in this modeling could have greater than 25% yield increases. But the problem is that most of those, those areas right now are either forested or protected. And incursion, agricultural incursion, would put the country at greater risk in terms of vulnerability to climate change because of the impact on water resources. OK, this map helps take the uncertainty for national governments out of planning for climate change. Uh, the red areas are the hot spots where um, beans, um, this, the map is just for beans, um, where beans can no longer be grown. But guess where the major bean producing areas for Central America are right now? They're this dry corridor that goes from Nicaragua up through Honduras. The yellow areas are the adaptation spots. And it's a very significant area in terms of size. It's huge. That is the area where governments are going to have to focus um, intense extension efforts to help farmers adapt. And the green areas are um, the pressure spots. Um, just to look at it from a different angle, um, over in the Today map, those are areas that conceivably could be grown to beans today. Um, and the change into the 2020s, the yellow and um, gray areas are where they can no longer be grown. And down in the 2050s, you see that the, the area keeps decreasing. Um, the estimated losses in terms of funding or um, economic income is 122 million for both maize and beans. And one of the things that the modeling raised was how important soil health is for um, maize resilience. Um, the graph or the chart on the left shows that um, using um, proxy indicators uh, in El Salvador, maize losses in the 2020s and 2050s are about 33%. But if on poor soils, but it, uh, if they're going on good soils, it drops to 1% to 2%. Um, and then the chart just shows the productivity and um, the economic losses. Um, and down here, this is a typo. It should be 102 million in ex econ economic losses just for maize. OK, um, smallholders in um, Central America, one of their best cash crops in the uplands is coffee. And um, we also did a study on the impact on coffee in Nicaragua. And um, what we found was the optimum altitude for coffee growing today is 1,200 meters. By the end of the 2020s, by 2029, that is expected to be at 1,400 meters. And by 2050, 1,600 meters. Smallholders don't have the funds to move up. And so that's going to be a real problem. And adaptation will have to include gradually transitioning out of coffee into things like citrus or other crops. Um, and just to give you one slide that's not Latin America, um, 
This is on the left is given today. Uh, it says today's temperature, but it's 1989 data. Um, the dark areas, the dark brown, is where robusta coffee uh, could be grown in Uganda. Um, the yellow are areas less suitable. And then with a temperature increase of 2 degrees Celsius, which is expected by 2050, it shows you the change in where coffee can be grown. OK, I am going to turn it over to Brent. Go through these quickly. Um, a lot of text, but OK. Uh, one of the important things, and particularly a point of, uh, just on a great example of some of the research in Central America, is the fact that uh, researchers, research systems, and extensionists have to really begin to work in much closer uh, uh, collaboration. In order to identify risks, climate change risks, I joined, uh, and the profiles of those impacts, locating the, and the geographic extent of some of those impacts uh, out on the landscape and the nature of their uh, thoughts and uh, threats and opportunity, the likely timing of those impacts. You know, we're talking about 2030s, 2050s. They're not all going to happen tomorrow. So we have to start getting, developing sort of a, a temporal scenario timeline for these things. And begin to get much better at beginning to assess the vulnerabilities uh, and resiliencies of the human and natural populations in those most impacted areas. Um, again, as, as Gabe pointed out in some of her examples, being able to capitalize on multiple win or no regret options. And by no regret, we mean you do them and climate doesn't change, you're better off. You do them and climate does change, you're much more prepared. So it's, it's no regret. Either way, you're going to come out better. Um, we need to look for those technologies that will improve our well-being in terms of productivity, profitability, uh, security, and, and also at the same time begin to improve our mitigation uh, uh, changes, our adaptation and the resiliencies of those systems that are, that are targeted. Uh, as I said earlier, we need to begin to think in parallel passions of both uh, 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 technical and then the social uh, backstopping that's required for most types of interventions in order to uh, improve uh, the resiliencies and reduce the vulnerabilities to key populations and identify potential market and non-market uh, uh, forces and, and incentives. With regard to technology transfer, um, really begin to get much more aggressive about uh, refining uh, new technical and social op options. Uh, look to forming national platforms for the exchange of networking and exchange of experiences. So we're not all on our stovepipe little programs, but we're actually helping to uh, facilitate the, 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 the lifting of all boats in the water, if you will. Uh, and really begin to get much more smart and in, 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 uh, skilled at prospecting for new solutions globally and also in the historical records. Uh, and one of the things that's dear to my heart is streamlining the procedures for technology release, particularly new varieties. We can't uh, get mired down in some of these uh, 10 and 20 year timelines. We're going to have to get some of these solutions out to farmers much more quickly. Uh, ICTs, uh, Information and Communication Technologies, are going to provide a, play a particularly important role. Uh, in terms of, these are just some examples of forecasting that's uh, important for policymakers. Uh, the type of weather information that farmers are going to need uh, to have access to to supplement their traditional ways of, of sort of sensing what's happening with the weather. And also some warning systems that are going to be targeted specifically at at-risk populations. Uh, coastal areas, uh, river uh, floodplains, and others that may be repeatedly hit by uh, severe and disruptive events. Uh, we need to really look in uh, and not just uh, uh, reform, but, but completely overhaul some of the pre-service education, in-service training programs so that those field agents do have a sense of climate change dynamics uh, so that they're beginning to utilize sort of broader systems orientation in terms of scale, multiple benefits, biophysical relationships uh, in those systems that they're working with, that they have some of the technical uh, competencies required to take on uh, adaptive uh, programming to help farmers become part of mitigation solutions and also to begin to strengthen those local uh, resiliencies. And they need to be very skilled at beginning to communicate the essential characters of climate change to farmers. You know, again, getting back to this notion, it's not just a matter of belt tightening for a couple of years and we'll get back to normal. The new normal is that change is going to be a continuous process. And that's a very important idea, a very difficult concept to get across. 
um, we need to begin to really do things that we haven't ever done before, and that's really conducting some organizational re reviews of our core uh, roles and responsibilities to identify and remove programmatic barriers where they exist, to capitalize on potential synergisms between different extension programs, be they in the agriculture ministries, livestock, fisheries, forestries. We can't be running our separate programs. We have to look at the relationships across programs. Bring, bring into coordination coherency, public and donor-funded uh, extension efforts. You know, it, it's, to be honest, it's, it's chaos out there in the landscape in most, in most areas. The Paris Declaration was trying to get us all in line behind government uh, uh, created plans, but it hasn't really taken effect. The CADAP process in Africa in particular has been very helpful, but we need to start aligning all of our investment uh, resources along the same uh, uh, implementation path. We need to help orientate the private sector interests in terms of responding to the challenges, but also beginning to be part of the solution. There, there's going to be a, a need for a lot of new technologies, a lot of new materials and support services out there. It's a huge growth area for the private sector, and we have to begin to mobilize some of those resources. And finally, looking at the policy and, and uh, issues, and I've got a great uh, example if someone wants to raise a question from Morocco about working at scales that matter. You know, the little 12 village sort of pilot activities, it's not going to cut it. This is global in scope. We need to start thinking about landscape level, large scale sorts of investments that are going to be necessary uh, for us to begin to meet some of these really important challenges. We need to harmonize a lot of the conflicting policies out there, conservation activities, price subsidies that often are, are, are a direct uh, conflict with each other's, and begin to plan and, and put some real resources in this human capacity building effort. I, I bring this up again and again, but the negligence that we have uh, directed towards the education systems, the agriculture education in-service uh, training program is going to come back and, and clobber us over the head if we don't wake up and start getting serious about training people and getting them out in the field and supporting them in the field to help farmers make these adjustments. That's all we have. We've gone on a lot. It's a very complicated topic. There's a lot of uh, other extraneous factors we could have brought in, but I think we've kind of captured the core, and I, I hope to be able to respond to your questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, now we're going to open it up for Q&A. We're going to alternate between our in-person and our online audience. Uh, Dar, how many do we have online? We have 110 people online. Excellent. Uh, so let's start it out. Again, say you state your name, uh, organization, and then your question. Uh, David Schroeder, Bureau of Food Security. Brian, you talked about CO2, and you had a lot of focus on CO2, but we know that the complex nature of climate change is also highly related to other types of gases mm -hmm. or vapors. And they actually are much bigger and more complicated than your CO2. Right. Water vapor, which obviously we have very little control of. And that just exasperates the problem. So um, even though you know I appreciate that focus, but I think we've got a real problem that we've got to understand that it's much more dynamic with nitrogen gases and water vapor particularly, which yeah. we don't focus on. So. Um, is this still live? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, the climate change scenario is, is much more complicated. Uh, we didn't realize really until 9-11 the impact of water vapor had on the uh, uh, transfer of energy from the sun to the planet's surface. But when we grounded all the aircraft in the United States, we saw the clear skies with modern instruments for the first time. And we began to appreciate how much we'd underestimated the impact of water vapor. Particulate is a screening effect. So it's actually Pollution in the atmosphere is a good thing because it prevents some of that energy from coming in. Uh, I did, we didn't talk at all about the methane uh, issue. And you know, I don't even want to go there. Uh, because the issue, it, it, it gets scarier the more you dig into it. It's a complicated uh, a picture. Uh, I just would encourage everyone to seek out information. Um, you know, this is kind of an awareness event of, about climate change as much it is as a programmatic uh, focus on, on extension in agriculture. But I think all of us in all of our different professions and, and uh, roles in, in, in life going forward uh, owe it to uh, the services we work for and the people we work uh, in, in, in be, on behalf of to become better educated and begin to build in uh, some of our knowledge and responses in, into the things that we can have control of. And this comes down to the personal stuff, using public transportation. Uh, you know, when you're in the hotel and not dropping your towels on the floor. All the little stuff matters because it adds up if we can all begin to get in line and start doing the things we should have been doing all along. We have a question from online. 
Yes, Francois Latijan from uh, Associate Professor in Agricultural Economics and Extension at the University of Fort Hare in South Africa asks, traditional land tenure systems and the scarcity of suitable extension technology tend to slow down the rate at which technology spreads amongst communal farming systems. How do we increase the rate of adoption? Well, I, we're going to have two examples. you want to talk about? I didn't hear all of the questions. Okay. It's about... Could uh, you repeat the question just... Sure, it's about how to spread appropriate technology amongst communal farming systems. Um, that's, that's a challenge, and um, it's going to become more of a challenge. Uh, we've been experimenting with um, use of farmer field schools and on-farm experimentation and making sure that our agronomists don't deal directly with farmers except as absolutely necessary. What they do is they train community, elected community farmers who then train the community in on-farm plots. Um, but it's a critical question and it's something that National Extension Services are seeking to improve. Um, okay. yeah. So I, I just want to add a couple of comments about that. You know, in, in, in the old days, right, when we had a normal climate or a stable climate, uh, really the acid test is whether farmers came to you. I mean, when you had a really good technological solution, uh, really actually controlling the message was more of a problem than getting farmers to adopt. And we used to, we used to have a, a general rule of thumb that you needed to be able to have a 20 to 25 percent demonstrable impact on the productivity of whatever component you were looking at before you would have large scale and rapid uh, uptake by farmers. The challenge going forward is, be, is farmers aren't going to be operating in a stable environment. That environment isn't changing. So it's going to be very difficult for them to foresee what might be appropriate uh, and effective under these changing uh, circumstances. So, you know, one of the first challenges, and we had it up on one of the graphics, was for extensionists to get the idea through and talk it through with farmers that the environment isn't changing. It's not a belt tightening, but we have to deal with, with a continual process of change. And as Gabe pointed out, if you get a disruptive event, a largely disruptive event, that actually is a huge teachable moment, a learnable moment where things have happened at, at such a degree that farmers are ready to try things that they hadn't been willing to try before. And particularly if you have some demonstration plots, you have a few lead farmers, innovators out there who have adopted the technology, use them as points of diffusion, bring as many farmers as you can in to see with their own eyes and talk to their colleagues, their fellow farmers about how that new technique, that new practice actually withstood or tolerated or was, was resilient to whatever impact they had just all experienced. That's a huge, hugely important thing. Farmers talking to farmers is so much more effective than extension is talking to farmers. So we have to be able to engage, again, these traditional social networks, uh, farmer innovation, and using this human-to-human -human contact to the extent possible. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. OK. My name is Sid Hamilton, and I am a doctor of plant ecology. I'm currently a AAAS fellow um, in the Bioenergies Technology Office at DOE. And my question is about this conservation agriculture, which is a new concept for me, as well as technology, innovation, and implementation. And of course, I'm going to be interested in it from the plant perspective. So what are some of the technologies that you find most um, favorable, plausible, applicable, that are specific to plants? For example, uh, synthetic biology or gene manipulation, things like this, or other um, uh, using, say, the plant microbiome as a way to develop adaptive ecological evolutionary uh, programs for increasing biomass productivity. Okay. I'll start. Okay. Um, the conservation agriculture concept, um, which I think you said you weren't familiar with, it maintains permanent vegetative cover on the soil surface all year round. And um, the, one of the standard combinations is maize with beans. And not clearing the soil residue, but then planting the maize plants into the bean residue 
and um, uh, what we're using more and more, both in Africa and in Latin America, is conservation agriculture under a dispersed tree system. And uh, the key principles are permanent vegetative cover, um, which increases organic matter in the soil, increases water retention, um, and the healthier plants um, are more resilient to climate change. Increase resilience or drought tolerance per se, or UV. Right? Uh, so not, that's okay, not necessarily because um, in that system you can you can apply improved maize and bean varieties that are themselves more resistant at the same time that you're building up the soil properties um, that help the plants uh, be more resistant. I just wanted to add a couple of thoughts. So, um, you know, as Gary was saying, healthy plants actually are able to tolerate a lot of different uh, conditions. Uh, they're less attractive to pests. They're more resilient to diseases, uh, in addition to other kind of uh, abiotic stresses. Um, you know, this is the time to think outside the box, and you're in a great field to do that. You know, whether you're taking the perspective of the Land Institute and looking at a, taking a 100-year breeding program on board to develop perennial varieties of some of our important grain products crops, or whether you're looking at going back into that genetic treasure trove of, um, of indigenous crop varieties. Um, you know, this is the, the phonios and the tefts and all the wordy millets and sorghum varieties that are out there uh, in forgotten parts of the world, and trying to screen back through those with relevancy to new and emerging conditions, because we've never done that before. We've gone back and looked at these genetic gene banks for what was. We, we, we aren't doing that. We're going to look for what is going to be. And that's a, that's a great undertaking. There was a, I had the fortunate um, opportunity to work for a study produced by the, funded by USAID, uh, produced by the National Research Council called The Last Crops of Africa. We went back in and looked at underutilized or, or non-used uh, wild and, and semi-domestic crop species. Uh, there's a huge trevor trove, uh, thousands of varieties out there that can be rescreened, looking at their ability to contribute in G uh, breeding programs for these future conditions. Uh, and you may very well find some some real uh, gems out there, but some of the modern the, the techniques that you're looking at, I'm really not uh, the person you should be asking. But you're asking, I guess, the right questions. So. Um, Brent, the the study you just mentioned uh, was that submitted to the Development Experience Clearinghouse, or is the findings from that somewhere available? It's a it's a three volume series. So it was done in the early 90s, 1992. The first volume came out in grains, and we ran out of money and couldn't publish the other seven volumes. Uh, they sat around for a decade, uh, looking for just some money to get the fully publishable volumes out. Uh, Noel Vietmar and Mark Deffrin, who used to work for the National Research Council, was spearheading that effort. Uh, bit by bit, additional resources were found, and two subsequent volumes have come out. Uh, one on vegetables, the other on uh, domestic and wild fruit species. Uh, but the, the material has been out there for a long, long time. It includes nutrition, it includes uh, environmental tolerances, it includes economic potential, and on and on. There are these big, nice, fat books. Uh, you can go to the uh, National uh, Academy of Science Press and, and buy them right now. Okay. Oh, we have a question from online. Yeah, there's a couple about the resources available to extension agents. Uh, Kevin Fath, a Peace Corps volunteer from Jamaica, asked what the immediate knowledge gaps for extension are. And Aaron Antcliffe from Engineers Without Borders Canada, who is stationed in Ghana, asks, the, given the decreased investment in, in extension and the increasing need for adaptive and innovative extension services, how to make extension services higher quality and more efficient in their delivery? OK. Um, let me jump in here. You can go. OK, so yeah, how, how do we do more with less? <laughs> um, this is a great one to think on your feet with. It, it, you know, you can't in some respects. You really can only do what you can do. And if you're just an individual or you're an individual in a small program, then you're going to be working at those kind of levels. Certain, uh, certain of, of the medias uh, can help us to have farther reach, uh, rural radio, uh, Farm Radio International has got a 30-year experience with being able to reach uh, farmers, farming communities uh, with relevant broadcasting, being able to do some of that social surveying first to find out what farmers are interested in, and getting farmers 
uh, engaged in the broadcasting. So it's, again, farmers speaking to farmers and having live uh, call-in programs. I was in a, a, a lunch uh, meeting in the middle of Morocco, and the guy got a call from a live uh, government official, got a call from a live radio program who with a farmer who had a technical question, and he stepped away from the table for five minutes and gave the answer. It went out over the national broadways, uh, uh, broadcast airwaves in Morocco, and he came back and joined us for lunch. But it's that kind of connectivity issue that allows individuals to reach more people than they might be otherwise. Um, Aaron, I'm glad you asked that question. Uh, you know, extension, extension practice, extension education has been the kind of forgotten stepchild of the whole agriculture development enterprise since the very beginning. Uh, it's always received the smallest portion of funding, uh, the least respect. We've been asked to take uh, messages that were inappropriate to farmers and have farmers yell at us because they're inappropriate, and not having good information to pass back to researchers or not being able to reach researchers. Uh, we've been in a very difficult position. I think this, these coming decades are going to be moments when we can shine. Um, I don't have any easy answers, but some of the things you're doing in Ghana, looking at the, using the lead farmer concept, uh, in, in your case, focusing on women in that program. I should, should mention Aaron's developing a case study. So you'll, you'll see this from the, the MIAS webpage, a nice case study that's going to be coming out shortly on uh, women farmers acting as lead farmers in their communities to get extension messages beyond the final reach of the public sector extension. But that, that, that last kilometer out into the village, out in the field with other women farmers, again, this notion of farmers talking to farmers about things that matter to farmers and languages that farmers use, so important as long as they're fed with that, with that important information. The real challenge is getting messages right or mostly right, right? It, 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 one of the worst things in the world is to be out in the field with the farmers and be very embarrassed because you got a dumb message. You obviously doesn't fit, but that's what you got from the office and that's what you're taking out because you don't have the freedom to do otherwise. That's the worst case scenario. Uh, you have to get right messages to bring out. And if they're only half-baked and we're going to get into the habit of delivering more half-baked messages to farmers going future, forward because we're not going to have the time to make them fully baked, let farmers know that. This is an idea. It's still tentative. It's a beta version. It's exploratory. But we think there's some potential here. Do you want to play around with it? Here's ways that you think you might be able to adapt it to your local conditions. That's really liberating for, for, for the extensionists because they're not just reading off the recipe any longer, but they're engaging other human beings in a creative in the intellectual process. And I think the more that we can get people's intellect and creativity engaged, the better chance we are in terms of being able to respond to a lot of these challenges we're facing. Um, I'd just like to make a comment on the content of extension. What I've seen in Latin America with reducing budgets, reduced budgets for extension, is that they're going out with packages. And it's a package for a particular crop um, responding to particular planting, fertilizer, weed pest control. And I think what we need to go back to in terms of extension content is basic agronomy. The principles of um, good soil management, good crop management, good water management, um, so that extensionists and farmers have a good, solid understanding of the basic principles of agronomy, um, because they're going to need it. A package isn't going to do it because things are changing too fast. And they need to understand the principles so that they can adapt. Could you talk a little bit about the potential for, oh, sorry, Lynn Dynamic with Accenture uh, Development Partnerships. Talk a little bit about the potential for using mobile phones, smartphones, you know, in the extension service area, having two-way conversations, at, you know, two-way communication, um, because I think that holds some potential uh, yeah. that has been piloted, exploited in some places, but really not fully exploited. Yep. Um, I'll, I'll make a couple comments, but probably it's good to go back to the AgriLinks site because there are some dedicated sessions and, and materials on the ICT utilization. Um, phones are wonderful. You know, I mean, we all have, I have three, actually. I'd be embarrassed, I have three. Um, but, it, it, you know, being able to communicate uh, only takes you so far. 
uh, SMS messages are good for pushing out sort of static information, uh, climate announcements, uh, uh, market prices. Um, for more of that more nuanced uh, sort of uh, needs of farmers at the local level, forget it. Um, the ability to have sort of call-in centers. You know, I'm Farmer X standing out here in my field, and I've got these brown spots on my maize plants. What do I do? E. If that's off-center or, or in any way is not an, an easy-to-find uh, uh, solution, um, you're not going to get the response. Yeah, you indicated you could take a picture, send that back. Well, that's pretty expensive. A, you've got a smartphone. B, you're paying for a smartphone data plan. Two very expensive things. Uh, it has to get to the right relevant person on the other side. One of the challenges with extension has always been taking standardized recommendation and looking at specific points of application. That only works in, in uh, so many contexts or with so, so many uh, kinds of uh, technologies. The idea that you'll have a centrally based expert that will be omnipotent in their knowledge of all the local ecologies and needs across the country is fallacious. And we need to get away from that, particularly with uh, examining the powers of this, this type of communication. There are needs out there that need to be custom made to each farmer's experience. And we're not going to be able to get that through a call-in show when you start talking about more detailed and nuanced kind of, of, of examples. Um, I've always found that there's, there's three kind of populations looking at this ITC issue. There's, there's kind of the, the, the technology, and I don't want to offend everyone, but there's kind of the technology geeks, right, uh, who are looking for, we, we, we have the solution, we're looking for a problem to solve. We have the, a lot of the educators that are looking at processes, uh, communication processes. And then we got this sort of Aggies, right? And, and, and it's really important to have these different perspectives in, this, in the room together when you're talking about uh, investments or in program development or, or ap application. I've seen very um, um, inappropriate sorts of answers coming out when you've only had uh, two, uh, two, two of the, the, the legs of the stool present. Things tend to fall over. So it's really good to have those different uh, perspectives there so you can have some important dialogue going on. It saves, it makes it cheaper. You have less expensive mistakes. Um, one of our partners you want to might check out is uh, Facet ICT for Ag. Um, you can follow them on Twitter. Do we have a question from online? Yeah, there's actually been a lot of really rich conversation going on online, and I'd love to share that with the presenters afterwards. Um, but we've got one last quick question. Um, Teshom Ragasa from UNL had asked um, that, that climate change is often expressed in terms of the effect on cultivated crops, and was wondering if you could point point them in dire the direction of the effect of climate change on the rate of losses in biodiversity. Well, you know, that's, that's a bit complicated. Uh, so there's, there's the, the temperature issue, right? And Gay had mentioned in the case of beans, uh, if you don't have nighttime temperatures that fall below, below 18 C, you're going to have sterilization. You're not going to have uh, pollination taking place, no re reproductive excess. Um, so all, all plants will have temperature bounds about their overall survival and particularly that unique moment of re reproduction. Okay, their little window of reproductive success. Um, there's, there's, there's moisture stresses that also come into play. So if you're in a, an area that is uh, experiencing changes in precipitation. And then there's some more um, things that you can't see. Uh, in the West African Sahel, uh, after 1970, when, when the water uh, stopped falling from the sky, it also stopped recharging groundwater aquifers. We saw aquifers, uh, groundwater aquifers falling uh, tens of meters. And you got out of the root zones of a lot of trees that weren't depending so much on uh, precipitation for their survival, but they were getting most of their moisture through their root system. But you removed that uh, water from the profile, and they died. We had die-offs of certain key species in the Sahel approaching 80, 80 to 100 percent in some areas. And it didn't have to do so much with the direct precipitation changes, but it had often to do with the loss of that groundwater. So you need, you need to be a bit careful about looking or what. Well, not careful, but you have to look in all the right places when you look at the impact. But certainly, uh, as any ecologist will tell you, our, our vegetative communities on, on this planet are, are the result of a lot of factors. There's the a abiotic uh, conditions, uh, soil, uh, soil conditions, rainfall conditions, and then there's all the things that, that people do exert over that, where we allow certain species to live because we cut them down or because of fire or because of grading and other things. And as both of those kind of bounding conditions change, both the biotic and abiotic stresses that are applied to plant communities, we're definitely going to see a lot of transformation and change. New, new species, or new weedy species in particular, annals are going to be emerging in areas where they've never been found before. And some of our old friends are going to begin to 
uh, disappear out of plant communities as whole plant communities themselves change. So, yeah. um, we're going to take our last question. Are we thinking about how we're, oh, sorry, making, uh, Patricia Langan with Making Sense. Are we, as we think about the future, are we thinking about how to adequately prepare future farmers? So are there opportunities for agricultural education in the formal and informal um, education systems that might be out there? Oh, I can. Um, yeah. Um, one of the